The beginnings of Mormonism will sound quite familiar to anyone who has been following this series. It began when its founder, Joseph Smith, claimed to have been visited by an angel of light called Moroni, who preached to him a different gospel to that found in the Bible. Joseph Smith himself belonged to a family that was heavily involved with Freemasonry. In the Mormon church in Freemasonry, Terry Chateau writes, The Joseph Smith family was a Masonic family which lived by and practiced the estimable and admirable tenets of Freemasonry. The father, Joseph Smith Sr., was a documented member in upstate New York. He was raised to the degree of Master Mason on May the 7th, 1818 in Ontario Lodge No. 23 of Canandaigua, New York. An older son, Hiram Smith, was a member of Mount Moriah, Lodge No. 112, Palmyra, New York. Joseph Smith was also a Freemason himself, who joined the Lodge in 1842. In his book, History of the Church, he says, he was with the Masonic Lodge and rose to the sublime degree. As a result of these connections, Joseph Smith borrowed heavily, you could actually say plagiarised from Freemasonry in the formation of his own religion, and the two therefore share extensive commonalities in terms of symbols, signs, handshakes, vocabulary, and clothing such as aprons and robes. Mormon temple garments also tellingly bear the square and compass symbol from Freemasonry, although Joseph Smith gave all these things a slightly different meaning. I'm not going to go into too much depth on Mormonism, but we only need to have a quick look around the home and centerpiece of the religion, Temple Square in Utah, which was designed to be an equivalent to the temple in Jerusalem to see the same old Babylonian symbols. The inverted pentagram, representing Satan for example, is to be found all around Temple Square in many different forms, such as here above the windows. We also see images of the sun and the combination of sun and moon that represents the union of the male and female principles. Above the door, we also find the all-seeing eye peeking out from behind a veil and surrounded by a sunburst. The veil could well represent the initiation of going through the veil towards the light, or the fact that the true nature of the cult is veiled to the uninitiated. One of the ideas Joseph Smith took from Freemasonry for his cult was secret handshakes, and this is also alluded to on the temple. Masonic buildings have similar engravings, such as this. Within Temple Square, there is a museum documenting the history of the Mormon Church. It too contains the symbols that betray its mystery root. These pentagrams are to be found at the entrance to the museum. Manley P. Hall wrote, in symbolism, an inverted figure always signifies a perverted power. The average person does not even suspect the occult properties of emblematic pentacles. You'll also find this sun god symbol at the same entrance, just right of the pentagrams. And now finally, here are some more of those inverted pentagrams in the kid's corner. Mormons are similar to Catholics in that many Christians are not sure what to make of them, they seem to be clean living, well-meaning, and use many of the same words as us, so there could be an attitude that they're basically on the same team with just one or two unorthodox ideas. Mormons actually believe that they can become gods through being a good Mormon, who will one day be given godhood over their own universes, and that God himself was once a man on another planet. These are, of course, lies straight from the serpent's mouth. They believe the Book of Mormon has higher authority than the Bible. They believe that there are many gods, that there is a mother god, that God has a goddess wife, that there is no salvation outside of the Mormon church or without acknowledging Joseph Smith as a prophet. And they also state that Jesus' sacrifice on the cross was not enough by itself and that we need to do good works as well, which is always a mark of a false religion. Hopefully this information, along with a quick look at the symbols, will tell you just who the spiritual power behind the cult of Mormonism really is, and will discover it has no compatibility with Christianity at all.
church does not want you to know. This video was made to expose a small number of truths that are hidden by the LDS Church. I hope that the viewer of this video has at least a cursory understanding of this church and its teachings. For the sake of time, I will only go over a few of the lies in this great sea of mist and disinformation. First, the Mormon Church will never tell you much about the actual life Joseph Smith led. Joseph Smith was a con man. Court records were found about 10 years ago stating that Joseph Smith was a glass looker i.e. someone who looked into an object in order to see the future for spirits. This was illegal and Smith used this transparently false activity in order to steal money. But it doesn't stop there. Mr. Smith also started a Ponzi scheme called the Kirtland Safety Society. This so-called bank was founded without a charter and used its own currency. This bank bankrupted its members and Smith was eventually found guilty once again of fraud. You hear a lot about the first vision in the Mormon church, but they don't tell you a lot of the facts. Smith changed his story on the first vision multiple times. Not to mention that the first version of the vision was published almost 20 years after the reported date. You won't hear about how Smith was finally kicked out of New York for his law breaking. You won't even hear that it was for those same reasons the Mormons were run out of Missouri. It is seen today as some Holocaust-like persecution. The truth is that Smith and his followers were trying to set up a theocracy. Smith more or less named himself king of the new territory. The Mormons were breaking the laws of marriage with polygamy, etc., etc. That's another thing. They usually only talk about Joseph and Emma, they don't seem to focus much on his 40 or so other wives. Keep in mind that many of these women were married to other men, but Smith claimed not only that God wanted them to sleep with him, but that they should not tell their other husbands. Also, they would never admit the fact that many of the wives were underage which furthered the crimes of Smith and his followers. You won't hear about the Nauru Expositor. The newspaper which dared to utilize free speech and denounce the Mormon Church. You won't hear that Smith ordered the destruction of this newspaper in its building and that it was subsequently burned. You won't even hear that this was the real reason he was put into jail. They wouldn't dare to tell you of this reason, and the above facts are the real reasons that Mormons were run out of Missouri. No, the Mormon Church would tell you that they were run out because of religious persecution. Once in Utah, you won't hear that the government would not grant statehood to this territory unless the Mormon religion denounced polygamy. You won't hear that is the real reason that polygamy was left by the LDS Church. You won't hear that blacks were not able to hold any priesthood position in the church until 1978. You won't hear about the heavy hand the LDS Church lays on politics. And they definitely won't tell you that one of their most sacred beliefs is nothing more than the tool of a cult. Ceilings are done in the temple to seal family members to each other for time and all eternity. The problem is that if a family member decides that the Mormon church isn't their cup of tea and that they wish to leave, these seals are broken and they are cut off from their family. It is a disgusting, vulgar attempt to use the love of your family against you. No other religion in the world utilizes these evil cult-like tactics in order to block exit from this deceitful church. How do I know all this? I used to be LDS. I googled reliable sources for information. I opened my eyes. The facts are out there. Joseph Smith, the founder of Mormonism was a trialled and convicted con man. His trick was to convince the credulous to part with their money in the name of gold digging missions, secret treasures by the defeated, the genocided Native American culture. There were those who claimed to follow the evidence at the time, to seek out treasure based on actual knowledge and there were a great many people who claimed to use certain magical powers. Joseph Smith belonged to both groups, claiming to have knowledge and also claiming to have necromantic powers. 
He was found to be a disorderly person and a con man, as well as disturbing the peace. Yet only a few years later, he would found Mormonism. Joseph Smith was visited by the angel Moroni on three occasions, and told there were gold plates on which were written the accounts of the lost Jewish tribe that came to America. The idea of the Book of Mormon is that it fills in the gaps after the New Testament, and therefore they can say of their religion that it's a restoration of the true Christianity. Even though he was an intelligent man, and able to express a story, he needed to have some kind of scribe, someone to write it down for him. Initially that was his wife Emma, and then a neighbour, Martin Harris. Martin Harris's wife, not convinced by this story, stole the first 200 pages of the Book of Mormon. She insisted that if Joseph Smith was genuine, he could reproduce those pages with ease. And it's understandable that people would have their doubts. You had Martin Harris on the other side of a sheet, so he could not look at the prophet, and could not look at the tablets. And he was told if he dared look at the prophet, if he dared try to look at the golden tablets, he would be struck down by God himself. So when Martin Harris's wife basically rejects this kind of story as probable nonsense from a known con man, is it any wonder? However, being a good storyteller, Joseph Smith had an answer. He said that those 200 pages could be in the devil's hands by now. And so to ensure that the gospel came out as it should, he could read from a very similar book about the same story. And so he had an excuse, which fooled Martin, that he was indeed legitimate as a prophet passing on the message from the golden plate to the Book of Mormon. Elohim, the Mormon understanding of God. The idea is quite different from that of conventional Christianity and indeed many conventional religions. The idea is that God is an exalted, perfected man. He has a physical body and there is more than one God. And that human beings, by following the true path of Mormonism, can become like God, although they still have a version of the Trinity. They have God the Father, also called Elohim. They have Jesus Christ, who is also the Jehovah of the Old Testament. And they have the Holy Ghost. Now even though the idea of the Mormon God, Elohim, is one of a physical God, with a physical body, this doesn't limit his ability, since the Holy Ghost is everywhere and in all things, thus enabling God's influence to be everywhere. A lost Jewish tribe came to America. Mormons are taught to believe that the Book of Mormon comes from those American Jews. A lost tribe of Israel that came to America, there was a combat between the two major factions. Those of pale skin, who are pure and bright, and those who had fallen from grace. These white American Jews were eventually wiped out, hiding the golden plates of the Book of Mormon before they were eventually wiped out. And those Jews who were cursed with darkened skin, who were no longer pure, no longer followed the way of Elohim, they became the Native American tribes. Mormonism and black people. They considered those of darker skin and those with the darkest skin to be the accursed people and those with the light skin, those who are white European, to basically be the purest. They thought against anti-slavery legislation. They even questioned civil rights for black Americans. Yet over time they changed their ways according to the times, because their leaders had revelations. Meaning that, when the leader of the Mormons, whether it's a modern day president, or one of their previous prophets, had the need to do so, could simply say, God's given me a revelation, and he now says, 
black people are in fact human. At one point in Mormonism, in relatively recent history, you are not allowed to be a deacon, a priest, hold any official role. You are basically simply allowed to be part of the congregation. That's now fully changed, and Mormonism fully accepts black people as being both human and worthy members of their religion. Polygamy, a somewhat similar story to that of racism, is the polygamy belief held by some Mormons. It was held very strongly in its early history, especially when Joseph Smith had a revelation so he could have yet another wife. But when Utah was going to join the United States, the United States said, we can accept your bigotry, we can accept your racism, we can accept your prejudice, but we're not going to accept polygamy. So the leaders of Mormonism had another revelation, in this case to do with dropping polygamy. One of the reasons they can do this is because of the idea that God speaks to everyone. So therefore God can give you a revelation. You don't have to be Joseph Smith. However, over the years, every time the main organisation of Mormonism changes a particular point of view, whether it's polygamy, it's you on black people, and various other ideas to do with the Mormon faith, you end up with someone who decides we need a traditionalist sect. And so you end up with an offshoot. And that's why you have fundamentalist Latter-day Saints who believe in polygamy, underage marriage, even underage sex, and many other things that are repugnant to the average Mormon. Missionary work. All young Latter-day Saint men are expected to serve as missions. They're expected to serve as a full-time missionary for two years. They don't choose where they're going to serve or the language in which they'll have to preach. They don't receive any economic help from Mormonism itself. They're expected to fund it themselves, their own mission work for two years, as well as receiving aid from their family. They must be 18, but no older than 25. They should not yet be married. They should have completed their secondary school and meet certain criteria for physical fitness and spiritual worthiness. Missionary service is not compulsory, nor is it required for young men to retain their church membership. However, rules for women are different. Where they're allowed to go for a shorter period, there is no upper echelon for the age limit, so it can simply be a personal choice on the part of a woman to be a mission, providing she's over the age of 19. They're opposed to marriage equality. The church itself is fully opposed to the idea of homosexuality in men and women. They're against marriage equality and equal rights. They accept the right of people to identify as being gay, as being a lesbian, as being bisexual. However, their church says practicing any sexual act which does not fit with their view of God is contrary to God's will. So basically, if you practice any form of sex or love with a potential partner, that means you're basically going against the will of God according to Mormonism. The Mormon Church has previously backed the idea that homosexuality is a mental illness. Yet just as they've changed their views on polygamy, on racism, and other issues, a revelation is surely due. Considering how they've changed their minds in the past, it's only a matter of time before they accept homosexuality and eventually gay marriage, as well as transgenderism and other relating issues. Baptizing the dead. Mormons have a belief that it's not simply that once you're dead, you're dead. You're condemned to all eternity to suffer if you didn't fulfill your destiny. Instead, you can be missioned to even after death. They believe by symbolically baptizing you post-death with a picture or simply your name can be enough to ensure that Mormons in the afterlife can reach you and help to correct your mistakes. The idea is that you didn't die a good Mormon. Therefore, they're going to symbolically baptize you by saying your name. 
So then you can be mission two by Mormon missions in the afterlife and so be saved. However, this belief in baptizing the dead has gotten them into trouble in the past. In the name of doing good, they try and collect as many names as they can. People who've died in wars, and of course the names of the people who died in the Holocaust, for example. However, if you don't believe in these baptisms of the dead, or indeed any baptisms, then what harm is actually done? In conclusion, Mormonism is a bizarre belief, with bizarre ideas, an obvious fabrication with obvious alterations, founded by a con man, passed on by people who are willing to change the religion massively to make it more legally acceptable, and over time may well become simply another version of moderate Christianity. There are errors in the Book of Mormon that are unique to the 1769 edition of the Bible, the one owned by Joseph's family. DNA analysis has concluded that the Native Americans do not originate from the Middle East or Israelites, but from Asia. There are things in the Book of Mormon that didn't exist during Book of Mormon times in the Americas. For example, horses, chariots, goats, elephants, wheat, and steel. There is no archaeological evidence for the millions of Nephites and Lamanites, even though we have evidence from smaller groups of people who existed thousands of years before. Book of Mormon names and places are strikingly similar or identical to many local names and places of the region where Joseph Smith lived. The Book of Mormon is remarkably similar to View of the Hebrews, a book published in Joseph Smith's area in his time. It is also very similar to the first book of Napoleon, published in 1809, and The Late War, a textbook written in King James-style language for the New York State school children in Joseph's time. The original 1830 text of the Book of Mormon had a Trinitarian view of the Godhead, and was changed over time as Joseph's ideas about the Godhead evolved. Over 100,000 changes have been made to the book. There are at least four different First Vision accounts given by Joseph at different times at least one of which didn't even include God or Christ. Scholars have translated the papyrus Joseph claimed the Book of Abraham was translated from, and found that they have nothing to do with Abraham or anything contained in the book. The church now tries to claim that translate meant get inspiration from. Joseph also penciled in some parts of the papyrus. Joseph married at least 34 women, many without Emma's consent, as forbidden in the Doctrine and Covenants and 11 of whom were already married, some without their husbands knowing. 10 of Joseph's wives were teenagers, some as young as 14. This was shocking, even by 19th century standards. Joseph also married some of his foster daughters. Joseph used a variety of methods to coerce women into marrying him, including promises of eternal life, threats of damnation, and even claiming that he himself was under the threat of an angel with a flaming sword. President Hinckley publicly said polygamy isn't doctrinal, despite teachings by numerous early church leaders, including Brigham Young, that it was essential for exaltation. The only scriptural justification for polygamy is to multiply and replenish the earth. So either Joseph was sleeping with his 14-year-old wives, or he wasn't adhering to the scriptural laws. Joseph married Fanny Alger years before he had the sealing power or received any revelation on polygamy. Brigham Young taught Adam God Theory at General Conference and as part of the Temple Endowment Ceremony. This doctrine is now disavowed by the Church. Brigham Young taught Blood Atonement, now also disavowed. This doctrine factored into the events which led up to the Mountain Meadows Massacre, where Church leaders murdered over 100 pioneers traveling through Utah. Black people weren't allowed to hold the priesthood until the 1970s. Joseph gave it to a few people, but from Brigham Young to Spencer W. Kimball, they were deemed unworthy to hold it. In the 1980s, the church paid around $900,000 to suppress bizarre and embarrassing church history documents. These documents were later proven to be fake. Mark Hoffman, the forger, turned out to be a murderer. Before the documents were known to be forgeries, church leaders gave talks offering explanations for them. 
Joseph Smith translated plates called the Kinderhook plates. He claimed they were a record of a descendant of Ham from the Old Testament. These plates were later found to be a hoax. Every spin-off of the LDS Church also has members say that they know their church is the true church. Other religions, such as Islam, say they know through the power of God. It's these same spiritual feelings that led to the mass suicide of the Heaven's Gate cult. Joseph sent Oliver and Hiram to sell the copyright to the Book of Mormon in Canada, saying he received a revelation to do it. They failed to secure the copyright, leading Joseph to conclude that not all revelations are from God. The church teaches that you should bear your testimony in order to gain one. This is a classic psychological tactic. You can feel the spirit while doing a multitude of things that have nothing to do with the gospel, even while watching some R-rated movies. Joseph and Oliver didn't tell people about the priesthood restoration until years after supposedly receiving it, and changed earlier revelations to match their new accounts. Joseph was hired to use the seer stone to find buried treasure, for which he was taken to court on charges of fraud. The Smith family was involved in folk magic and the occult, practicing animal sacrifice, conjuring spirits, and using magical parchments and talismans. People at Joseph's time had a magical worldview, which included seeing things with spiritual eyes, including the golden plates. Martin Harris was known as a gullible man who changed religions at least 10 times. Even after becoming Mormon, he was a witness to self-proclaimed prophet James Strang. Strang also had gold plates and used a Urim and Thummim to translate them. Martin Harris also said that he had as much evidence for a Shaker book as he had for the Book of Mormon. He also said he saw Christ in the form of a deer and talked with him. David Whitmer said he saw an angel with his spiritual eyes and said his impressions were just like those of a Methodist having happy feelings. People in Joseph's time believed in a spiritual second sight and that it was no different than seeing something with your physical eyes. The witnesses did not sign their own signatures or write their own accounts, except Oliver, who was the scribe. All of the Book of Mormon witnesses, except for Martin Harris, were related by blood or marriage to the Smiths or the Whitmers. Joseph had many people sign an affidavit, saying he wasn't practicing polygamy when he was. Some of those who signed it were also practicing polygamy. Joseph didn't even use the gold plates to translate the Book of Mormon. He also couldn't retranslate the missing 116 pages taken by Martin Harris's wife to test Joseph's validity as a translator. Joseph revealed the LDS Temple Endowment just seven weeks after his Masonic initiation. The endowment is nearly identical to the Masonic ceremony in numerous ways. The temple ceremony was supposed to be eternal, yet blood oaths and other disturbing elements were removed in the 1980s, just a few years after those elements were removed from the Masonic ceremony. Joseph Smith made a number of prophecies that were never fulfilled. According to Deuteronomy 18, this would disqualify him as a prophet. If Adam and Eve were the first humans, how do we explain the 14 other hominin species who lived and died 35,000 to 250,000 years before Adam? Science has proven there was no worldwide flood 4,500 years ago. Simple mathematics and logic of animal food consumption show there was insufficient room on the ark to house all of the animal species found on the planet, let alone the food required to feed them. Science also discredits the idea of the Tower of Babel, 600-year-old humans, Jonah and the whale, people turning into salt, and carrying honeybees across the ocean. In contrast to Jesus Christ, the Old Testament God condoned genocide, slavery, rape, and racism. The Church has removed material that is not faith-promoting from its history and been dishonest on numerous occasions. In Kirtland, Joseph created an illegal bank and used fraudulent means to raise money. Once his fraud was discovered, he fled to Canada, leaving the church members to pay his debts. The church has not been transparent about its finances since 1959. The church spent $1.5 billion on City Creek Mall, more than it spent on humanitarian aid in almost 20 years. The early church taught that tithing was 10% of your surplus the church now teaches that it's 10% of your income, even if you can't afford to pay your bills because of it. 
The church's name has changed a few times, at one point removing Jesus Christ and being called the Church of the Latter-day Saints. The church has taught that the prophet can't lead the church astray, despite obvious mistakes made by past prophets. Church leaders such as Boyd K. Packer have counseled historians to avoid telling the truth if it isn't faith-promoting. In 1993, six scholars were excommunicated or disfellowshipped for publishing their scholarly research on Mormonism and its leaders. Dallin H. Oaks said, you shouldn't criticize church leaders, even if the criticism is true. Joseph Smith, his father Joseph Sr., and his brother Hiram were actively involved in the occult while living in Palmyra, New York. Joseph Sr. considered his money digging an occupation and often brought Joseph Jr. with him on his expeditions. This involved special rituals and ceremonies which were performed for the purpose of obtaining buried treasure. It is through these expeditions that Joseph found his beloved seer stone, which he used to try to locate treasures of gold and silver. Joseph would place his magical rock into a hat and pull the hat up to his face to block out all light. By doing this, he claimed he could see supernaturally and would help those who were digging by locating the place where the treasure was buried and observing the spirits that were guarding it. Joseph and his father's money digging continued until at least March of 1826. On March 15, 1842, Joseph joined the Masons, which is an organization that believes Jesus is not divine and is on the same level as Buddha, Muhammad, or any other religious teacher. Within one day, Smith rose to the highest degree, which is the sublime degree. Joseph's Masonic membership affected the development of the Mormon Church in many ways, but the most significant area appears to be in the development of the Mormon Temple Ceremonies. On May 4, 1842, only two months after joining the Masons, Joseph introduced the Temple Endowment Ceremony. LDS historian Dr. Reed Durham had this to say about the Masonic influence on the Mormon religion. There is absolutely no question in my mind that the Mormon ceremony, which came to be known as the endowment, introduced by Joseph Smith to Mormon Masons, had an immediate inspiration from Masonry. It is also obvious that the Nauvoo Temple architecture was in part Masonically influenced. Indeed, it appears that there was an intentional attempt to utilize Masonic symbols and motifs. I suggest that enough evidence presently exists to declare the entire institution of the political kingdom of God, including the Council of Fifty, the Living Constitution, the proposed flag of the kingdom, and the anointing and coronation of the king, had its genesis in connection with Masonic thoughts and ceremonies. It appears that the prophet first embraced Masonry, and then in the process, he modified, expanded, amplified or glorified it. Dr. Durham also said, included in the actual vocabulary of Joseph Smith's counsel and instructions to the sisters were such words as ancient orders, examinations, degrees, candidates, secrets, lodges, rules, signs, tokens, order of the priesthood, and keys all indicating that the society's orientation possessed Masonic overtones. In April of 1974, Dr. Durham announced an important find, not realizing the implication of his discovery. In his presidential address to the Mormon History Association, he spoke of yet another interesting occultic article called the Jupiter Talisman, which was described by Joseph's wife, Emma, as one of the prophet's intimate possessions. Dr. Durham had this to say about the mystical powers of the talisman. When properly invoked, with Jupiter being very powerful and ruling in the heavens, 
These intelligences, by the power of ancient magic, guaranteed to the possessor of this talisman the gain of riches and favor and power and love and peace, and to confirm honors and dignities and counsels. Talismatic magic further declared that anyone who worked skillfully with this Jupiter table would obtain the power of stimulating anyone to offer his love to the possessor of the talisman, whether from a friend, brother, relative, or even any female. In the same address, Dr. Durham also stated, in some very real and quite mysterious sense, this particular table of Jupiter was the most appropriate talisman for Joseph Smith to possess. Indeed, it seemed meant for him because on all levels of interpretation, planetary, mythological, numerological, astrological, mystical Kabbalism, and talismatic magic, the prophet was in every case appropriately described. This is a very significant finding because we keep close to us the things which we find important. And for Joseph, that was riches, power, and his love of women. We know that these were the beliefs of Joseph Smith right up until he took his last breath. This talisman was found in Joseph's pocket the day he died in Carthage. Another thing that was really interesting in studying the roots of Mormonism was to find out that Joseph Smith wore a Jupiter's talisman and uh, his brother Hiram had the family parchment and they kept those on their bodies hidden. Another thing that most Mormons do not realize was that Brigham Young was cut from the same cloth. He wore a bloodstone around his neck as protection until the day he died. One indication we have uh, as an insight into Joseph Smith's character is the value he placed in a particular magic object called a Jupiter's talisman that he had had through his life. We aren't sure just when he first got it, but evidently as a teenager. But he kept it on his person until his death. And a Jupiter's talisman is a magic object that one would use to uh, empower one with uh, money, finances, uh, power over people, power over women. All of these things were items Joseph's life was geared towards. He wanted power, he wanted money, and he wanted women. Uh, the fact that he died with the Jupiter talisman on his body shows that throughout his life, he continued to hang on to that hope and that trust in that magic object. Hi and welcome and thank you for viewing this video on Mormon doctrine and how it is unbiblical. My name's Terry. I'm a Christian. Uh, I was raised as a, as a Baptist, but I don't attend a real denomination. But I'm a Bible believer and I'm born again. I believe in the Bible as the Word of God and write for correction and reproof against anything, any false teaching. Now, today, a Mormon guy was talking to me on YouTube, and I told him that nowhere in the Bible does it say that man can become a god, in the sense that God is a god, you know, that the Bible clearly teaches that when we are in heaven, we'll be as angels, and we'll be servants to God, that God was never a man before he was God, and that there was no pre-existence that the Mormon doctrine is unbiblical in that sense and that God does not have a wife God does not procreate spirit children and we are not all brothers and sisters from a pre-existence now the man sent me a link to argue and refute everything that I said saying that they did use uh, scripture because I told him that I would not go to the link for the simple fact that you know, I can back up my beliefs with scripture, but he has to use extra biblical sources. And I said that's very similar to many uh, Muslims that try to talk to me. Uh, the, actually, the last link I clicked before this that was sent to me, you know, was from a Muslim, and the entire website was about calling Paul the Antichrist and saying that, you know, when Jesus speaks about Antichrist, it's really talking about the spirit of Paul in his teaching, which is totally unbiblical and wrong and had no backing. Well, anyways, 
I told this guy that I wasn't going to go to his link and look it up because I already knew everything about the doctrine of Mormonism on becoming a god and how it's unbiblical. But he came back to me and he said that they do use scripture on that site. So I said to him, you know, God said that to man, come and let us reason together. You know, and I'm paraphrasing, probably. But I said to him, if God can reason with man and he asks us to come reason with him, then we should reason with each other. So I said, you know, for once, I'll go to this site and I'll look at what they have to say. But if I see anything that's unbiblical or wrong in the context of the Bible, that I would bring it back to him and show him and we could discuss it, right? Uh, so I get to this website and I'll put the link on the uh, video for YouTube. But I'll just read from you what it says. And this is about uh, Mormon doctrine. Okay, so here, here's what the, the site says. First, you need to read the rest of Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis 3, 22, it states, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. Therefore, as the Lord himself says, Satan told Eve a half-truth. The adversary lied when he said that Eve would not surely die, but he told the truth when he said that she would become like God, knowing good and evil. To spread the false notion that Latter-day Saints do not show proper reverence towards the Godhead, anti-Mormons often tell people that Latter-day Saints believe that they will become co-equal or on the same level with God and no longer worship Him. This misre misrepresentation is a twisting of LDS doctrine called exaltation, a doctrine which the Bible clearly teaches. Latter-day Saints believe our Heavenly Father has given us this mortal life to become more like Him. Those are those who are true and faithful in all things will sit in the throne of Christ, Revelation 3.21. They will have the name of God the Father placed upon them, Revelation 14.1. We believe that they shall be heirs of God and joint heirs of Christ, as in Romans 8.17. What shall the faithful inherit? All things. According to Scripture, Hebrews 1.2, see heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, and then it quotes scripture saying, Be therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Matthew 5, 48. And then, For I am the Lord that bringeth you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. And, beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, Christ, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is first uh, John 3 2 and verily verily I say unto you he that believeth on me the works that I do shall he do also and greater works than these shall he do because I go unto my father John 14 12 all right so I just want to look at one scripture, and that's the very first one they quoted in Genesis. And we'll just go straight to that and prove it wrong from the Bible. And I hope I can help anyone that's seeking truth and wants to ask questions. And I would like for every Mormon that sees this video to ask themselves this question and to pray to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and ponder about these things. All right? Now, in quoting scripture, they are right. Uh, God does say that man has become like one of us. It says that in Genesis, you know. And I'll, I'll put all the scripture references up on the screen. Of course, you guys will already see it. It'll already be there right now. So, uh, it says man has become like God, knowing good and evil, right? But, if God intended man, and th this is the question I want to ask, if God intended man to, to become a God, ruler over his own planet or universe or world, whichever you'd like to choose from the uh, Mormon doctrine, and to procreate and you know do all that great stuff, then why did God command Adam not to eat of the fruit? Why? If he wanted us to become like him in that sense, knowing good and evil, why was it a sin? Why was it wrong? 
why did they inherit death and destroy the entire perfect world, in a sense, and corrupt it, that God had made by becoming like God? Why? Does that make any sense, is what I want to say. If that is what God intended to do since the imaginary pre-existence, since when he was a man before he was God, and he became a God through becoming like his God before him, ruler over his planet, then why was it a sin for man to become like God, knowing good and evil? Why did God command them not to do that? Well, from my understanding of the scripture, man was made to worship God, to glorify God, right? And to take care of the world, to look after it. You know, in a sense, kind of like a gardener or uh, a shepherd, you know, something like that. To look after God's creation and to worship Him in truth and in spirit, as the scripture says. So how in the world, how in the world does that make any sense? And again, they like to quote another scripture, and I'll put it up on the screen because I'll paraphrase. Uh, it says, you know, in Psalms, in one of the Psalms, that God says, you know, you are like little gods, something along that lines. But they never quote the verse right after that. Right after that, when it says that, it says, I have said, ye are like gods, you know, I'm paraphrasing. But you shall die like men. And he's insulting the Pharisees and things, I mean, in that sense. He's saying, look, I said you'll be like me. You'll be gods like me. You're like little versions of me. But you will die as men in your sins. And so, you know, all the other unbiblical doctrines, a Bible-believing Christian that believes and trusts the Word of God cannot believe in the doctrines of Mormonism or the, the LDS Church or Joseph Smith because it directly contradicts it. God in Isaiah, if you read Isaiah, and I'll, I'll put some quotes up here, it says many, 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 many times there's only one God, there's none like Him, He knows not any other God, there's none like Him, it's clearly seen from the foundations of the world, from the times of old, there is one God and there's none like Him. So again, so again I say, my question is, if God intended us to be gods in a sense like He is, and the Mormons claim that in the garden when that happens, that's proof for it, then why did God command us not to do that? Why did He say, don't eat the fruit? Don't do that. You will surely die. Why? That's my question. Because it makes no sense to me if they teach that God has always wanted us to be a God and that that proves that we are to become gods, why did he command Adam not to do that if he wanted him to do it? You see, it makes no sense. You can refute a big claim with just a small verse, just a few verses out of the Bible. And I hope this helps, and God bless all of you, and leave your comments, and uh, if you have any questions, you know, send me a message. I'm free. I'll talk. Thank you, and God bless. Take care. Bye-bye. animation to show you what Mormon theology is really all about. Mormonism teaches that trillions of planets scattered throughout the cosmos are ruled by countless gods who once were human like us. They say that long ago on one of these planets, to an unidentified god and one of his goddess wives, a spirit child named Elohim was conceived. This spirit child was later born to human parents who gave him a physical body. 
Through obedience to Mormon teaching and death and resurrection, he proved himself worthy and was elevated to godhood as his father before him. Mormons believe that Elohim is their heavenly father and that he lives with his many goddess wives on a planet near a mysterious star called Korah. Here the god of Mormonism and his wives through endless celestial sex produced billions of spirit children. To decide their destiny, the head of the Mormon gods called a great heavenly council meeting. Both of Elohim's eldest sons were there, Lucifer and his brother Jesus. A plan was presented to build planet Earth, where the spirit children would be sent to take on mortal bodies and learn good from evil. Lucifer stood and made his bid for becoming savior of this new world. Wanting the glory for himself, he planned to force everyone to become gods. Opposing the idea, the Mormon Jesus suggested giving man his freedom of choice, as on other planets. The vote that followed approved the proposal of the Mormon Jesus, who would become savior of the planet Earth. Enraged, Lucifer cunningly convinced one-third of the spirits destined for Earth to fight with him in revolt. Thus, Lucifer became the devil and his followers the demons. Sent to this world, they would forever be denied bodies of flesh and bone. Those who remained neutral in the battle were cursed to be born with black skin. This is the Mormon explanation for the Negro race. The spirits that fought most valiantly against Lucifer would be born into Mormon families on planet Earth. These would be the lighter-skinned people, or white and delightsome, as the Book of Mormon describes them. Early Mormon prophets taught that Elohim and one of his goddess wives came to Earth as Adam and Eve to start the human race. Thousands of years later, Elohim, in human form once again, journeyed to Earth from the star base Kola, this time to have sex with the Virgin Mary, in order to provide Jesus with a physical body. And after Jesus Christ grew to manhood, he took at least three wives, Mary, Martha, and Mary Magdalene. Through these wives, the Mormon Jesus, for whom Joseph Smith claimed direct descent, supposedly fathered a number of children before he was crucified. According to the Book of Mormon, after his resurrection, Jesus came to the Americas to preach to the Indians who the Mormons believe are really Israelites. Thus, the Jesus of Mormonism established his church in the Americas as he had in Palestine. By the year 421 A.D., the dark-skinned Indian Israelites, known as Lamanites, had destroyed all of the white Nephites in a number of great battles. The Nephites' records were supposedly written on golden plates and buried by Moroni, the last living Nephite in the hill Cumorah. Fourteen hundred years later, a young treasure seeker named Joseph Smith who was known for his tall tales, claimed to have uncovered these same gold plates near his home in upstate New York. He is now honored by Mormons as a prophet because he claimed to have had visions from the spirit world in which he was commanded to organize the Mormon church because all Christian creeds were an abomination. It was Joseph Smith who originated most of these peculiar doctrines which millions today believe to be true. By maintaining a rigid code of financial and moral requirements and through performing sacred temple rituals for themselves and the dead, the Latter-day Saints hope to prove their worthiness and thus become gods. The Mormons teach that everyone must stand at the final judgment before Joseph Smith, the Mormon Jesus, and Elohim.
those Mormons who were sealed in the eternal marriage ceremony expect to become polygamous gods in the celestial kingdom, rule over other planets, and spawn new families throughout eternity. The Mormons thank God for Joseph Smith, who claimed that he had done more for us than any other man, including Jesus Christ. The Mormons believe that he died as a martyr, shed his blood for us, so that we too may become gods. But ripping on Joel Osteen, I know he's a great public speaker, but at least he loves the Savior and wants people to become like him. And at least instead of spending his entire ministry getting up and ripping on the LDS church or the Catholic church or whatever church it is, that you spend your days ripping on. An hour a week. You do not emulate what to me is a Christ-like true Christian. And I know some really great Christian. Oh, I, I bet you do. Not spend their time okay, with Mary, you made the point. Let me tell you something. I don't give a rat's rear end what you think. Okay? This is what I care about. Truth. I care about truth. And wait, Jesus... Wait, wait, wait. wait. I let you talk. Uh, wait, I let you, t I let you talk. You. Mary, no, Mary, 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 I let you talk. Oh, I'm an evil person, and I feel sorry for Mary, Mary Margaret and all why, your children. Wait, wait, Mary, why are you ripping on me? Why are you screaming at me? Let me talk. Oh, I, you started screaming when I was uh, me, No, I let you finish. Let me talk. I give a rat Mary, let, Mary you, you made some propositions here. Let me speak. I don't care I don't what your opinion is of what Christianity is or isn't. We have facts. When someone... That dilutes the facts or changes them, I am going to stand up and say, why are you interrupting me? Why are you interrupting me? Trying to be like Christ. But ripping on the prophet of the Mormon church and the person running for the president of the United States, they so what? Listen, is evil. The You're an evil person. What are you talking about? Let me if Jesus was here, he would rip on Monson too. And he would no, say, he don't vote for a Mormon. And he loved them. And he, you know what? You're just deluded. He loved them you, no matter you what care, he did. What are you? He used to be a really good person, and you've become evil. He's a really good and person, and, and I am not a person for speaking truth. you have truth. about you and all your black clothing. All my black... Ma Mary, did you hang up now? No, okay. I didn't. I'm still okay, here. Okay, just let me speak here. Just for a second, without you interrupting. What is truth, Mary? Truth is trying to become like the Savior. And live a life your, like he did. On your own, wait, Mary, okay, I just want a simple, on your own terms? On your own terms, we, it's becoming like him, and we try to read how about do you him in the Bible. Wait, 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 okay. How do you know who he is and pray to him? How do you become and, like him, Mary? How do you become like him? Explain that to me. How do you become like him? Yeah. You pray to him, and you develop a personal relationship with him. Okay, but first that doesn't. Of I gotta stop you. Are you LDS? Are, are you, you as a person become have a relationship with the Savior? How does that happen? And then you share that with others by okay. teaching them love and okay. Christ. Like you don't. Okay, stop, you don't stop. Have that okay, at all. you okay. have an evil spirit about you. Okay, I have the evil spirit. And I put this to the channel. Oh, please, spirit please, King, Mary, and please. I can see it. Can I follow? You can see it. Okay, Mary, are you LDS? Yes, I am. Okay, you know very well you don't pray to Christ. So why are you saying that here? Because you pray in the name of Christ, and you name, know that, you God, to... and you know. Okay, I know, I know. That's why I'm calling you out on it. You don't pray to Christ. Well, Christians do. Yes. Christians do. Mormons you do not. You know that I know. And spending Mary, your time ripping on the LDS Mary, church, okay, you made your point. Isn't about being Mary, Christian. And I know a real, uh, really, really, I know, really I know. Mary, Christian let's leader. talk about Both facts, Mary. Mary, Mary you know Christians and Baptists. And... Mary, let's talk about facts, okay? You say that you... You become a you get in a relationship with Jesus Christ. How does that happen, Mary? How does that happen through reading your scriptures and daily prayer? That's how you establish a relationship with Christ, Mary. Have you been born again? Yes, I have. How did that happen? How does happen being born again, accepting the Savior into your life, and who's and the, and and who's like the Savior? I'm sorry. And who is the Savior? You're Mormon. Tell us who the Savior is. 
Who is the Savior? Yeah, who is he? He's Jesus Christ who died for us. You know that. He, uh, don't, don't add, I know that, okay? Because you, we're having a dialogue here. Let's just, let's just tone it down. So you say, he's, is he God? He is God, yes. He is God, okay. Do you worship him? Yes, I do. Was he created? Yes, he was. He, by whom? Who was he created? Who was he created by, Mary? Yes, he was created by our Heavenly Father. Okay, with who? I'm sorry? Where did his spirit come from, Mary? It's always existed. Okay, but where did it come from? Because he's our brother, right? So where did I Jesus' spirit come from, Mary? It has always existed. No, that, it's, it's always existed in what way? Matter that, matter that has always existed. Matter has always existed, according to Joseph Smith. Was Jesus a created being in his person like Lucifer and like you? His spirit? Yeah, his spirit that came down and took on this body. Was that formed and created by the Father? The spirit, was the spirit already existed. I know the spirit matter existed, but was the spirit matter formed into the spirit of Christ being a great and noble one prior, quoting the book of Abraham, like yours was and mine was and Abraham and every inhabitant of the earth, was Jesus created it by, in his spirit by the Father in the preexistence? He was created just like us. He's okay, thank you. Now, let me ask you something. If he was created, how did he create all things? He created them with through the heaven, through Heavenly Father. But wait, Scripture says in John 1, He, Jesus, created all things. All. Okay? And the Greek is emphatic that it's all things. How did Jesus create all things? And the reason I point this out, Mary, is because you say, wait, you say, I want to have a relationship. You get that by reading the Scripture, which includes Bible, Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, Pearl the Great Price, and you pray to Him, but I want to know who you're praying to, you see, because the Christians, Mary, believe Jesus is God uncreated no beginning alpha and omega no end and he created all things do you believe that as a latter-day saint you know, true true christians do believe in the father and the son and the holy ghost i'm not saying there wasn't a father and son and holy ghost i want to know about christ to you mary you are if you if you're speaking truthfully as a latter-day saint jesus was created in his spirit just like you and i were he is our elder brother spiritually he offered to come down for us this is so contrary to how Bible believing Christians believe Mary exactly it is contrary to how it they is believe. contrary and so now on that premise it doesn't no. say that I'm not Christian because it's contrary to how they believe because we we differ on some things some it things take away that an LDS person is Christian okay Mary Mary let's just talk about God though his father our father in heaven where did he come from Mary he has always existed where did he come from was he ever a man, Mary? Okay, you're getting way too deep into this. No, I'm just asking you. Was, was he a man, Mary? He, he may have existed as a man. Okay, so now we have <laughs> no, another fundamental difference. No, 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 no. We have another fundamental difference. The God we worship is not a man. He's never been a man. He does not have a penis. He does not copulate with Mary in creating Jesus in a body of flesh. So you call here and you spin this screaming yarn, which I'm returning to you now, and you act like, oh, we're so Christian and you're so not, and you have an evil spirit and, and we're the same. And then when we just ask about five questions, you fail on every one of them. Every single one of them you fail based on what the Bible says. And you call here and you get on my case and you say, I have an evil spirit. You are deceived. This is the reason we do it, Mary. Because everything you believe, everything, is a falsehood relative to biblical Christianity. I feel sorry for you. I don't care what you crazy. feel about me. It's irrelevant what you feel. What are the facts, Mary? What are the facts? Research your prophet Joseph Smith's life. Research the doctrines you say you believe in. Go to your temple and swear oaths. If you'd like to make a call, please You gotta understand when they're screaming, I scream back. It is part of the entertainment. I could sit with Mary right now, have a Diet Coke, eat fries, and talk normally. But when we're in this debate, they call because they have a voice and they think they can show everybody listening 
how smart they are and how good Mormonism is. And it's a lie. It's part of the fraud. So you got to hit them right where, they're, right where they're at so that you can show them you are not telling the truth. I wish Joel Osteen would. Did you notice that she brought up my criticism of Joel Osteen? You know, but before I thought she never even mentioned Joel Osteen, but he sided with the Mormons. I wish Joel Osteen would say, Mitt Romney says he believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Why doesn't Joel Osteen say, Mitt, who is, the, who is Jesus? Why doesn't he say, who is God? Why doesn't he say, what do you think of the... Uh, we could talk about how they say Jesus was a created being. Bible says he's the Alpha and the Omega. Uh, Bible says he was not created by anybody. He's uncreated. M Mormons say he was a created being. Mormons say he is our spiritual brother. He's a spiritual brother to Lucifer. The Bible says, no, 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 no. Lucifer is a fallen angel. Jesus created all things, including the angels, including Lucifer. Mor the way it goes, my friend. Well, speak more yeah. slowly and clearly. It's okay. Like I said, I've been a member for 15 years. Yeah. I like the rhetoric. I've been a member for the last 15 years of this faith. Okay. I grew up Irish Roman Catholic first and foremost. Okay. All of the stuff that you spew out about the church. I've heard about religions for years. Okay, you've heard yeah, it I, all. What does that mean? What are you trying to say? I don't like the way you're talking about faith. I don't care what you like or not. You know what I like? I like truth. No, no, no. I don't know. Yes, yes, yes. I don't like your guys standing up there and telling people I love lies so that they'll continue to try to figure out the bondage they're under to go to your temple. So don't call here and tell me you don't like how I talk about your faith. I'm giving you facts. You've heard them this whole time, and what have you done? This? You may be talking facts, Jack. I have given you so, facts. I've given you references. Been, what do you but, want? Been, like I said, I've been kept faith. Okay, I can't. There's something Lies, wrong. Is it me? Trash for decades. Okay, you've got to slow down because it's not coming through. This is great. He has to I've heard slow, more than you'll ever know. I grew up with the faith. I spent eight years of my life. Okay, all this is subjective experience. Give me that something that's real. Time I've heard their lies. I, 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 I. Give me something that's no, real. I go out. I go out. I don't care how you grew up. You Give that, me something that's you real. Trash the religion all you want to do. I, I'm not trashing the religion. I am pointing out turn facts. Back on the faith because whatever, whatever reason you turned your back on the faith twenty some odd years ago, pal, or thirty some odd years ago, it's your problem. You have the problems with that. I don't. Really? I, I enjoy it. Fine, enjoy it. Enjoy it, enjoy it. Enjoy it, dude. I am not saying, oh, I'm, look, enjoy it and turn the channel. I am going to teach the truth. You can go back, put on your, your blinders, put your, your fingers in your ears, your and enjoy work. your truth, your little fiction. You know, there's people who go to Disneyland.